I'd like to, I'm going to talk about a difficult man today and a man very few people could agree on or can agree on today. But one thing that was always undisputed about Louis Agassiz was that he was a great lecturer, a very tall act to follow. And I thought I'd do something that uh, Louis Agassiz did in his lectures that made him kind of um, famous. I thought I'd pass something around. It's not very valuable, by which I don't want to encourage you to keep it. Uh, but it's a, um, it's a little ruler that says, it's Agassiz's motto, study nature, not books. And it was released by a, um, a company that produced microscopes. Um, it, that, um, it's plastic, so it's not really from Agassiz's time, but I thought I'd give you something to hold in your hand, and maybe by the time I'm done, it's made the rounds here. Um, just to sort of cue you in, um, um, into this man and uh, his uh, very interesting but difficult legacy. Louis Agassiz, who's featured here in this carte de visite, was born in 1807 and he died in 1873. Um, he was once considered one of the world's top scientists, probably the most recognizable name. Today, he certainly is not and I cannot tell you how many times I was asked when I was working on this book, um, but I was writing the life of a tennis player because that's <laughs> usually what was associated with the name Agassiz. Um, and Agassiz's fall from grace, here you have him again. Actually, this is before the fall from grace. There you have him the way he wanted to be featured. Um, and you can just make out, it's a little blurry, but if you look in the background, you can just make out the Arc de Triomphe right behind it. That's how Agassiz wanted to be seen, you know, as as the person in charge, as the top dog next to this chair. This is a hand sign carte de visite, these little photographic images that people would pass out. And Agassiz was very fond of doing that um, because he was kind of a rock star. But uh, just to anticipate the ending of the story, if you look at that, that's Agassiz in the ground, which actually did happen in 1906. Stanford campus, an earthquake uh, put, uh, put Agassiz right into uh, right underground. Um, interestingly enough, Alexander von Humboldt, who was also um, one of the statues, stayed right where he was. Um, and uh, the story is that the Stanford students were very excited. You can barely make out the hand here that the finger is still pointing as an example of how Agassiz would never shut up, even when something like that would happen to him. He was wrong about many things. Um, he believed that the theory of evolution was all wrong. He was Darwin's great antagonist. He was the man that Darwin knew he had to bring down if he wanted to succeed in, in the United States. And one of the incredible things about the antagonism between Agassiz and uh, Darwin was that Darwin, in fact, succeeded. He had some help, uh, but he did succeed. Uh, he was a racist. He believed that human races were biologically different, distinct, and that, of course, the white race was superior. And um, he did not keep that opinion to himself, but made it a matter of public record and did a lot of damage in the process. He built a museum at Harvard, the Museum of Comparative Zoology, that never quite took off the way he extended, intended it to be. Today, it is successful, but it is largely due to the efforts of Agassiz's successors. Uh, the um, museum itself was because Agassiz could never stop collecting, was filled with specimens. It was not open to the public much of the time. Agassiz, in a very rare moment of introspection, once said, my museum overflows from garage to cellar. Indeed, there were specimens wherever you went making it very, very difficult to uh, create that kind of public institution that Agassiz wanted. Um, so Louis Agassiz, in many ways, and I'm quoting from a, uh, a statement by a modern scientist, Agassiz was a windbag, he said. He was not somebody uh, that uh, we really need to remember much. Of course, there have always been defenders. There are several biographies of Agassiz. An admiring early one by one of his students, Jules Marcou, published in 1896. And there's one written in the last century by 
Edward Lurie, a historian, um, came out in paperback as well, which really tries to describe Agassiz's importance for the history of science. He was historically important, an argument that really has Lurie in many ways running up against walls. If he was so important, one may ask, why do people confuse him with a tennis player today? When it comes to historical significance, Darwin, featured on the right here, has won the battle. So why then write another book about him? It's not like I set out to write a book about him. I worked on Longfellow. I spent several years writing a critical biography of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who was one of his closest friends. There you have Longfellow featured on the left in an ambrotype from 1862. He was friends with Ralph Waldo Emerson, who called him a man to be thankful for. And last but not least, the young William James in a self-portrait that James did from during the expedition to Brazil in 1865, um, where James participated as a young student. Agassiz was the professor who would take his students out into nature, which was an entirely new thing, field work, catch nature in the act, as he called it. And he was right there next to his students, wading into the water, um, he, uh, grabbing specimens. At one point, he plunged his microscope into the water because he wanted to be close to the specimens. He didn't want to take them out and then lose that kind of immediacy that he was interested in. Um, he was right next to them, digging through barrels of fish, um, trying to locate that one specimen that he, was, that, that, he, that he was looking for. He was there hauling creatures from the ocean with a net, his thinning hair with water running down, uh, his forehead glistening with sweat. These are all accounts that we have of Agassiz's activity in the field. Um, he was a fascinating guy for many, as he was for William James at the outset of the trip, the embodiment of somebody who gave everything, everything he had, to science and the success of his science. He also wrote very well, as, as I found out if, uh, once I got more interested uh, in, his, in his writing. And I still have a copy of the, uh, the first book that I purchased secondhand, Agassiz's Geological Sketches, um, which you're welcome to look at afterwards. Um, this is a passage from Geological Sketches, which is just wonderful in many ways. Um, the world is the geologist's puzzle box, he says. And I actually put a puzzle box, not Agassiz's puzzle box, just to illustrate what a puzzle box is. The world is the geologist's puzzle box. He stands before it like the child to whom the separate pieces of the puzzle remain a mystery till he detects their relation and sees where they fit. And then his fragments grow at once into a connected picture beneath <coughs> his hand. Um, Agassiz was after that connectedness. He was really convinced that science could take you to a point where you understand everything there is to be known about nature. Um, there's an unpublished little fragment that I found when I was looking at Agassiz's papers about Psalm 8, where Agassiz basically um, says that the power of the scientific intellect exceeds that of God. The Old Testament prophets have been replaced in Agassiz's mind by the scientist, who is a much more superior intellect, somebody who knows the wonders of nature and can point them out. Um, there's a passage in this, in this fragment where Agassiz actually writes about death, and death for him is not the moment where insight stops. It's not, there's a great poem by Emily Dickinson where he says death is the moment where you no longer see, where, we are not, where, where you are no longer able to see to see. That's not for Agassiz. Agassiz says, and I quote, to fear annihilation of the human mind on account of death, is it not as weak and puerile as the error of these simple children of nature who thought the sun was extinct when they saw the moon pass over and hid his face at midday? So the keys to the secret of nature for Agassiz are located in the mind of the scientist. And the scientist is, in a sense, as Agassiz sees it, the King David of the 19th century. His path to that insight was a very circuitous one. It was not one that, that was very direct. He was born in, in Switzerland, um, close to the Bernese Alps, in a little place called Motier. His father was a country parson, and these were people who were kind of limited in their ways of looking at the world, which is something that for Agassiz was, uh, was a problem for young Agassiz. His father once defined, we have letters from his father written to his son, he defines science 
as a, as a form of balloon that takes you higher than anyone should ever travel. Um, certainly not Louis Agassiz. He wanted him to be a businessman. He wanted him to be a country doctor, to live close to home. And, and Agassiz wanted more. And he indeed succeeded. He left Switzerland, studied in Heidelberg, in Munich with the best of them, ended up in Paris finally working with the great Georges Cuvier, shortly before Cuvier's death and uh, managed to befriend Alexander von Humboldt, who became his great mentor, um, a guy who lent him money and would write letters to him that a loving father would write to a son. Um, always ex you know, trying to sort of encourage Agassiz to be not so, not so strict about things, you know, to branch out a little bit, uh, to be a little loose, but Agassiz wasn't, wouldn't hear any of it. Uh, Agassiz settled down in Switzerland as his parents wanted, in Neuchâtel, at a small preparatory college, uh, which became too small for him very soon. He spent a lot of time hiking, um, climbing mountaintops, uh, trekking across glaciers, um, very, very outdoorsy. And uh, what he did is something, as he was doing that, what he did is something that became sort of a precedent for future uh, work that he did. He took great ideas that he heard other people talk about and fused them into something that could be his own. And this is what happened with the theory of the Ice Age that is probably most connected with his name, even though Agassiz was not the person who came up with the idea that the world at different stages had been covered with a sheet of ice, which would explain continuities in the record of natural history. Agassiz was not the one who came up with that idea, but he would take these ideas and fuse them into something very, very elegant. And what he also did is he made beautiful books out of it, which became, again, uh, a feature of his work. I have one actually not uh, the book about glaciers, which is very, very valuable. It's a different one. Um, he had his own printing company, and this is indeed a volume that was produced in Agassiz's own printing company uh, of invertebrate animals, not of glaciers, but you can take a look at it if you like. Um, it's from the 1840s. This is from his glaciers book, Etudes sur les glaciers, 1842, beautifully illustrated. Um, an indication of what Agassiz was interested in, Agassiz would actually live on these glaciers. He had a hut that he built, and he has collected students around him, would go up there and spend time with him in a place called Hotel de Neuchâtelois, where the people of Neuchâtel could basically live on the glacier. Unsurprisingly, his home life suffered as a result. Um, he had married a very gifted painter, <coughs> Cecilia Brown, um, Cecile, as she was renamed uh, in French, even though French was not her native language. Um, this is a portrait of Agassiz that his wife did, uh, which I located at the Natural History Museum in London, um, showing Agassiz in profile. And I don't know if you can make it out. The lectern is right in front of it. He's holding a little book in, in his hand. And in this book, it says in German script, Louis A.G. Agassiz loves his wife, I'm translating, and his wife loves him. So she makes him read this book, you know, <laughs> holding it in his hand. And it's interesting and very poignant that she's actually doing it in ink. It's a pencil drawing, but this is something that is important to her. Cecilia got fed up with Agassiz. That's the end of this, uh, the, sh the short version of the story. He was gone most of the time. He brought strange people to live in her house. People would curse and would, you know, expect her to serve food. And, so she took something that most 19th century women wouldn't have dared to do. She packed her stuff, got her kids, and got the hell out of there, basically, which was a uh, devastating blow to Agassiz, to Agassiz's ego. Uh, he didn't know what to do. Um, once again, Alexander von Humboldt came to the rescue and got him a grant from the Prussian king that helped Agassiz to embark for the United States in 1846, uh, where he stayed for the rest of his life as a professor of natural history at Harvard University, really putting science, institutionally at least, on the map. The Lawrence Scientific School at Harvard was Agassiz's creation, something that he was associated with from the beginning. And he established a reputation as a public scientist, as somebody who was admired by ordinary people and fellow scientists alike, at least uh, for most of his career. Agassiz was drunk 
with the beauty of the new world, and especially invertebrate animals. He had spent a lot of time studying fossil fish before he came to the United States, and now he became interested in jellyfish, as different, as soft to the touch, as fossil fish are hard to the touch, so to speak. This was something that entranced him. And you get a sense of um, his prose when you just look at this little excerpt from one of the first things that he published. It is indeed a wonderful sight to see a little animal not larger than a hazelnut, as transparent as a crystal, as soft as jelly, as perishable as an air bubble, uh, run actively through as dense a medium as water, pause at times and stretch its tentacles, and now dart suddenly into one direction or another, turn round upon itself and move suddenly in the opposite direction, describe spirals like a bird of prey rising in the air, or shoot in a straight line like an arrow, and perform all these movements with as much grace and precision, and elongate and contract its tentacles, throw them at its prey, and secure in that way its food with as much certainty as could a larger animal provided with flesh and bones, teeth and claws, and all the different soft and hard parts which we consider generally as indispensable requisites for energetic action, though these little creatures are, strictly speaking, nothing more than a little mass of cellular gelatinous tissue. So, um, you know, that was the time when scientists took delight in prose, and you can see how that sentence in its in its accumulation of, of, of linguistic material, tries to mirror the excitement that he feels uh, and in looking at these animals. Um, again, with beautiful illustrations. Um, so he's really trying to turn what he sees in a tactile experience in, in, in ways that make us almost touch the specimen and they caress it. Um, the results are always predetermined because at the end of the process you find out what you already know because that's what Agassiz's science is about. It confirms your expectation. Um, it sort of reminds me a little bit this obsession with seeing nature of some story that Agassiz himself liked to tell how once when he was eyes had sort of given out, had gotten dim from too much looking uh, and he couldn't really see anymore, he would take a specimen, a fossil, and would actually lick it, would try to taste it, because he wanted to get the sense, of the, the sense of its materiality, because the eyes couldn't provide him with that anymore. Um, showing you another image from uh, probably his most spectacular uh, image of a Cyanea arctica. Um, and he is aware, as you see in this, in this quotation, he is aware that you cannot just import what you know as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a human observer into the world of nature. Is that which is called a mouth and jellyfish is truly a mouth? Is the so-called stomach truly a stomach? Are the so-called ovaries really ovaries? Are the tentacles in any way comparable to those of mollusks or worms? Have the parts designated as arms any resemblance to the upper limbs of the vertebrates? The most active imagination, one like Agassiz, is truly at a loss to discover in such a creature anything that recalls the animals with which we ourselves are most closely allied. So there is a gap. Um, in a sense, this obsession with seeing things reminds me of um, uh, Agassiz's contemporary, Herman Melville, who also in, in Moby Dick, his famous novel, is obsessed with trying to, with looking, but also trying to figure out how exactly it is that, for example, a whale sees. Agassiz does not make that step. For him, it is always clear that there is a human observer who is different, who is in charge, who is on top of things. Not the step that Melville would take. Melville goes, goes farther than that in his writing. Um, when you remember the famous um, ending of Moby Dick, where Starbuck says, too little, too late, of course, he says, he seeks thee not about Moby Dick. Nature doesn't need you. She doesn't need you to look at you. It doesn't want you. Darwin knew that. Agassiz, not. Um, he does have a sense for the wonder these creatures represented, a marriage of the material and the spiritual, really. Um, for Agassiz, just at the time when Darwin is sort of challenging the conception of species, when he's, you know, saying that species, the, the whole concept is an ephemeral one, for Agassiz, species is a thought in the mind of God made material in nature. And, um, and that, that to him is, is something that he's not willing to give up. Well, the problem with Agassiz is, and I alluded this to the beginning, um, is that uh, he was a racist, or not just a garden variety racist, but someone who used his public position 
and I'm transitioning from all these wonderful descriptions of jellyfish to another aspect of his career. Um, not a garden variety racist, but somebody who used his public opinion, his public standing to uh, pronounce, to offer pronouncements on that. Um, over the course of the 20th century, his racial views have kind of attached themselves to his reputation, and rightly so, like a foul odor. He was the first, or has the doubtful distinction of being one of the first to commission the use of the camera for the documentation of racial difference. And here you have one of his controversial images there at the Peabody Museum at Harvard, um, a, uh, a, a sort of collection of daguerreotypes that were supposed to document racial difference, racial difference among African American slaves. Um, race was not a topic that, uh, that Agassiz had been interested in before he came uh, to the US uh, in 1846, even though European naturalists had, spell, had spilled a lot of ink on that issue. Um, fish, invertebrates, glaciers had preoccupied him. But when he comes to America, as early as his Lowell lectures, the first series of public lectures he gave, he announced that he was going to move in this area, and people did notice. He said, among other things, that Genesis, the book of Genesis, in its account of creation, really only applied to Caucasians, which is something Asa Gray, botanist at Harvard, took note of. And he said in a private letter, he said, this is not something that we should talk about. This was the beginning of Agassiz's polygenism, the theory that human races have been separately created by God and that the white race, as he felt, was superior. He c continued to do science the way he'd always done it, though now what had been basically been a loose band of brothers helping him, assistants that he gathered around him, became a corporate um, enterprise. Here he's with uh, Benjamin Peirce, um, Actually, in person, is pointing out the location of Cambridge, Massachusetts on the globe, which is where Agassiz's um, corporate enterprise is located, his corporate scientific enterprise. His racism did not, I would say, affect his science so much as it fit neatly into a conception of science where nothing ever changes, where things do not move, where things stay in their assigned places. And one of these, sort of the bad noir of Agassiz, was um, racial mixing. Um, it was a theory that appealed, as Darwin dryly observed, to Southerners especially, who responded very well to it, but also to Northern abolitionists who wanted their slaves free but didn't want them as their next door neighbors. Um, so Agassiz's support was widespread. In fact, I mentioned, as you might recall, Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, saying he was a man to be thankful for. And the interesting thing about this remark is the context in which Emerson makes it. It's, it happens on the beach at Nahant, where Agassiz had a seaside lab laboratory. They're sitting on the beach and they're talking about Brazil. And Emerson says, and I quote afterwards in his journal, that Agassiz was a man full of facts with unsleeping observation and perfectly communicative. The context of the conversation is, a, uh, is Agassiz's report about his experiences in Brazil, where he'd gone and he had been telling Emerson about the effects of racial mixing, how it demoralized Brazil, Brazilian society. And Emerson says, a man to be thankful for. Something we need to remember when we, uh, when we talk about 19th century racism. In my book, I was interested in the coexistence of these two things in Agassiz, the capacity for wonder that I've tried to illustrate, and the crude, intolerant moralizing about racial inferiority that we also find in him. Um, the latter is, I think, part and parcel of Agassiz's notion that science, given world enough and time and a lot of money, can arrive at a full understanding of God's plan for nature. An ambition that Darwin, in one of his greatest letters to Asa Gray, compared to the attempts of a dog to understand the mind of Newton, trying to understand all of nature, which Agassiz felt he could. Well, it's easy to say, of course, that, well, there was the 19th century and we are past all that, but are we really? In, um, I just recently finished reading a splendid book by um, Lucy Hughes Hallett, a biography of the Italian poet uh, Gabriele D'Annunzio, uh, who had, has plenty of things uh, to apologize for, if we look at it. And she says, uh, there's a remarkable sentence in that book, which also applies to my understanding to Agass of Agassiz. 
to suggest that his thinking is aberrant is to deny the magnitude of the problem he presents. Agassiz wanted, and this is, I think, his problem, he wanted to be a top-notch scientist. But he also wanted to be relevant publicly. He wanted to matter. And that's precisely what led him into trouble. His desire that, as he put it once, that science become part of the general fabric of society. It's a pretty provocative idea, but also a very, pro pro uh, very problematic one. He felt that everyone theoretically could be a scientist. And there was his mission, as America's top scientist, to get you to that point. He would write public accessible articles, would lecture wherever he could. Um, he provided expertise uh, for Barnum's Museum, for instance. He was not, be, uh, not above that. Um, fishermen, school teachers responded to him. He, in his last year, uh, he convened the um, Anderson Summer School of Natural History, and more than a dozen of the participants were women that he'd encouraged to come because he felt that science also should not distinguish between the sexes. Um, by that time, this is actually an image, um, I left that out, of Brazil from that trip in Brazil when Emerson and, uh, and Agassiz were talking about Brazil. Uh, these are images that were um, produced during that expedition, um, which are now at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. By the time Agassiz did his public outreach, um, his wife, Elizabeth Agassiz, had become part of his enterprise, and a very prominent enterpri uh, enterprise it was. You see Elizabeth Agassiz surrounded by her stepdaughters. Um, Elizabeth Agassiz, his second wife, was a wonderful writer. Um, she brought Agassiz's manuscripts into their final publishable, publishable form. She was his ghostwriter, um, always cultivating herself sort of the stance of the amateur as somebody who was not really a scientist, but nevertheless making sure that the science was always accurate. And she had to find a way to be unlike him in order to make her way as, a, as an educator and promoter um, of women's education. In her prose, and this is where it gets very interesting, Agassiz's authoritarianism is displaced. It be, often becomes a bit of a joke because he's so obsessive. She describes all his peculiarities um, in articles for the Atlantic Monthly, or in private letters, um, a variety of, uh, of, um, of forms. On Agassiz's last expedition, the voyage of the Hassler, 1871, um, basically a recreation of Darwin's voyage of the Beagle. Elizabeth Agassiz, who is portrayed right here, you see the artist has made, has taken this photograph and basically made sort of a sketch of outlines here. Um, and it's interesting to see this woman prominently sort of in the first row of the groups of, of the group of scientists assembled on the Hassler. On this journey, Elizabeth Agassiz, she writes copious letters uh, to her mother and sisters back home. She's able to see the Fuegians, for, ex for example, as having a humanity even Darwin, and certainly not her husband, would grant them. Agassiz's party ended up where Darwin's science began, and that was not coincidental, on the Galapagos Islands. And while Agassiz's assistants were finding any number of wondrous creatures, you know, hauling them up, the, the Hassler was a ship equipped with dredging equipment, hauling them up from the deep, Agassiz held fast to his conviction that Darwin had gotten it all wrong, as he felt. The Galapagos were, he said, geologically speaking, of very recent origin, and could, therefore could not serve as an illustration of Darwin's process of natural selection because obviously, as Darwin himself had conceded, this process takes time. Geologically, this was an impossibility, as he felt. Darwin had been, and I quote from lectures he gave on board uh, the Hustler, um, um, Darwin had been on a wild goose chase in the, in the Galapagos and had, not, had brought us not an inch closer to a proper understanding of why things had developed there the way they did. And this is Agassiz in 1872, he's still fighting that battle. Knowledge is not, says Agassiz in his lecture, not advanced by argument. He's not realizing he's doing the, is the same thing, obviously. The interesting thing is that Elizabeth developed a very different view, and I quote uh, from um, 
one of her uh, publications about the Hassler trip. Our collections, she says, were indeed large and varied, but they would have been a little more interesting if we had been less hurried, she says. This is Agassiz, always collecting, 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 collecting. Elizabeth is, uh, Elizabeth is saying, we should have taken more time. Maybe, she says, the final proof of whether natural selection is true or not has to wait for a more patient student, and I quote. Radliff College, which Elizabeth Agassiz helped found, was in a sense the culmination of Agassiz's own attempts to include women in scientific education, and yet in many ways it was not. As president of Radcliffe, Elizabeth Agassiz ex never expected the kind of following that Agassiz had demanded from his people. Um, there's a famous story about her at graduation scattering all the diplomas and basically making a mess of the whole ceremony because she was uncomfortable with that role, um, which people felt was just perfect in the early days of Radcliffe because it was also a little non-threatening, especially to Harvard, always concerned about what was called the annex becoming more prominent, developing more of an identity. Alumni later remembered the freedom of choice they had in those early days, and I'm showing you a uh, picture of the class of 89. They always remembered the freedom of choice they had in those days. They were allowed to take Sanskrit or Greek drama, um, even if the enrollment, for instance, of the Sanskrit, the Sanskrit class was just one stu student, nobody else had signed up, but it was just fine. Um, discarding the voice of institutional authority that had been so important to her husband, Elizabeth Agassiz, in her own life and writing, replaced it with a voice her husband had always suppressed, the voice of someone who wants to know but is forever left wondering. And I would like this to be the conclusion of my brief sort of tour through Agassiz's life. Um, I'm happy to entertain questions or go back to any of these images. Um, so. It's um, really something that I um, spent about a decade researching, and you probably realize just from the complexity of, of the topic, you know, what a difficult, difficult thing this is to research, because you find yourself being pulled in different directions at the same time. So if anyone has questions, if anyone, <laughs> and still thank you. And I think they have a microphone here. Um, we do, we do have two microphones. If you could just put your hands up, we'll do our best to come around and get your questions on mic. Should we start here? Uh, your first slide was of Agassiz at the blackboard drawing. Yes. So yeah. do you think that his powerful, I mean, and he was very, very, do, does your book deal with the, his own drawing? Um, yeah, I, I, let me go back to the slide. So unfortunately, I have, to, I have no other way than to rush you through the entire uh, slideshow one more time. Um, Agassiz was famous for his uh, lecturing, and um, one of the things um, that he did very well was uh, impromptu drawing on the blackboard. And one of the things that helped, that helped him a great deal, and he would usually, we have lots of accounts of how he did it, because he was a rock star, essentially. He was ambidextrous, and it was not something that he would immediately reveal. So he would start drawing with one hand, and then all of a sudden the other hand would come up and do the same kind of thing or something similar. And that was, it was a parlor trick um, if you want, but it was, was really effective in terms of uh, relating to his audience. The drawings were very, he was very attuned to illustration. He had artists working for him, but he was always checking on what they were doing. So on the drafts and proof sheets, you actually find him correcting or making little notes. So it was, it was really important to him the, yeah, sorry, my, go my, ahead. The, my essential question that just occurred to me in your talk was, uh, do you think that his powerful, formidable aesthetic sensibilities, which we see in the prose yes. and the drawing and the illustrations, yes. do you think that that influenced his racism in a sense of some aesthetic perfection that he absolutely could not uh, stomach for a uh, I have not seen evidence of this. It would, in a sense, be um, make it more complex and more interesting, I guess, but uh, what, what I see in his racism is, is really kind of crude, crude uh, thinking for the most part. Um, I think his, he was so enamored with his role as a public scientist that he felt he had to weigh in on it, and some of his science uh, is, well, his racism not on the level of his scientific thinking. 
Um, one of the you know most obvious things is his concern with racial mixing. You know the whole like notion that um, mulattoes are uh, biologically inferior and so forth, uh, which raises the question, the logical question, why one should be so concerned about racial mixing, right? Um, it's something that had never occurred to him as a paradox in his thinking. So it's an interesting question. I can't answer it in the sense that I have not found that this aesthetic sense um, is, is really important to him. It is, in a sense, important for Darwin. Um, you know, our story usually works that way, that Agassiz is the bad guy and Darwin is not. But when you look at what Darwin in The Descent of Man, when he talks about aesthetic preferences and that races will stay in their own provinces, so to speak, because of aesthetic preferences. Um, they, there are aesthetic barriers to, a, to a racial mixing. Agassiz would always say they're biological barriers, which Darwin exposes as nonsense. And uh, there's no, and he's, he's adamant that it's nonsense, right? So I think it's a little, I wish it were more complicated, I guess, and it's an interesting question that I'll think about a little more, but I can't immediately confirm it. Yeah, go ahead. You, you mentioned that um, your research revealed that some of Agassiz's contemporaries in Cambridge, like Longfellow and yeah. Emerson, were sympathetic to his social views. Yes. Well, did your research reveal anything about how he was received or perceived by the Harvard faculty? How, oh, how, did, he, how did he get along? Yes. Yeah. Um, one slight qualification. Um, Longfellow was not in sympathy with his social views. Um, Longfellow is probably one of the very few sort of mainstream American figures that I, that I found to be entirely free of the taint of racism. And that was, it's a great mystery why he was such good friends with Agassiz and why he remained so. But it's, it's very obvious in Longfellow's journals and his responses to that part of Agassiz's thinking that he has nothing to do with it. Agassiz was a power uh, wielder and he was very successful at Harvard to implement this up to a point. One of the part of the story that I left out, but I mentioned Asa Gray as um, briefly, the botanist on the Harvard faculty, uh, who was not somebody Agassiz took seriously when he started out there. Agassiz built his power base very cleverly. The museum, the fundraising that he engaged in, people that he got, got hired at Harvard, you know, basically extending uh, the circle of his power inexorably over many, many years. And Asa Gray, who was Darwin's friend and Darwin's supporter, who was not a man that Agassiz felt was cosmopolitan enough, was um, smart enough to do damage to him, Asa Gray came out of the woodwork and literally destroyed Agassiz's reputation. Over many years, he did so in steps. He would spring parts of revolutionary theory on Agassiz at meetings, um, would, um, would ridicule him increasingly, and would finally uh, also mess with Agassiz's influence in larger professional organizations because um, Gray was not a man who would immediately share things publicly as Agassiz did. He did not wear his heart on his sleeve. He would not always um, reveal. He was a very, very strategic man. And one of the fascinating things of Agassiz's story is that this little man who was a Presbyterian, was religious, you know, taught Sunday school, um, thought that Walter Scott was the pinnacle of literature and so forth, uh, that this guy would basically be in a position to do that kind of damage to him. And he would send these hilarious letters to Darwin after he had successfully done something to Agassiz publicly and would say, oh, Dar Agassiz walks around Cambridge like a well-cuddled dog, for instance, um, because Agassiz was not prepared. He was not ready for it. And so you see his position at Harvard being eviscerated. When he died in 1873, he still got, you know, the fantastic burial. He, everyone attended, the vice president came and so forth. So things were still in place, but over the next sort of two decades, you see Agus, uh, Gray's work coming to full fruition and um, he succeeded, basically. Um. One of the slides, I think it was the one with the drawing of the jellyfish on it, talked about uh, yeah. the species which were more closely allied. I mean, how did he see similarities between species if he saw each species as its own discrete packet, I guess? Uh, it was part of a complicated uh, taxonomic system that he developed where everything belonged to a taxon where things would be in their assigned places. Um, species have been put, and this is really where it becomes non-scientific, in terms of Agassiz's understanding, it be put into their places by God as, as separate acts of creation. 
Uh, so even if there were similarities, there were intellectual similarities that had been planned by the divine intellect, so to speak. So uh, quotations, in a sense, in the book of nature that would sort of refer to each other, but not as part of a biological process um, that you know, Darwin was so busily identifying and you know, explaining at the time, if that makes any sense to you. Was there any part of Agassiz's early religious education that precluded him from accepting uh, evolution as, 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 as a means of uh, species differentiation? Yeah, I, um, Agassiz had a, you know, the Calvinist influence was very strong in, in Agassiz's upbringing. Um, I think that um, he dispensed mostly with the religious influence of his family. He was um, to, at least his American contemporaries, a man who was unpredictable in a religious way. He would not go to church, for instance, as even Longfellow observed, that Agassiz's not the church-going kind, he wrote in his journal, um, because his God was more comprehensive than any kind of uh, specific religion could fix into place. I think the influence, uh, the main influence on Agassiz's thinking was European. It came out of European natural philosophy. It came out of what he had um, basically sort of uh, absorbed when he, when he went to uh, uh, Heidelberg, Munich, and, um, and the influences of people who, you know, thought in ways that were not responsive to the, to the Darwinian natural selection process, who assumed that there was some kind of creative force in nature um, that, that shaped nature, that, that resided in it, which is something that, um, you know, Darwin could not uh, use for, for his science, this kind of uh, metaphysical conception of nature. Um, Darwin didn't need God as a hypothesis for his science, famously. Uh, for Agassiz, what he did and what he became so popular in America, I think, resonated very much with the transcendentalists. This is why Emerson liked him so much. Um, the kind of notion that nature is, has the spiritual essence um, that, we, that we see if we immerse ourselves in it. Um, so I think the, the religious influence, the lingering religious influence um, in, his, in, his, in his science is less, in his education is less important for the science that he does eventually. Um, he rejects his father. Um, in other ways, he is like his father because he becomes the kind of doctrinaire, intolerant guy uh, who won't brook any opposition and gets rid of his assistants uh, as soon as, they, as, they, as, they, as, as their opinions differ from him. Uh, so I know it's a kind of complicated answer that I'm giving you, but I think it sort of moves into a different direction, his, uh, his religiousness, um, as, he, as he matures as a scientist. You spoke of Louis Agassiz as a rock star and of his effort to popularize science. Was he successful as a scientific rock star and how? I mean, was he yeah. getting American farmers and fishermen to be fascinated with fossils and jellyfish or was he convincing them all that yes. God created the races separately and that they're all unequal and that Darwin was wrong? Yeah. He, was he was successful in the sense that the public responded. Uh, to his, and there's many examples of this. In his own time, um, it, it, when he started out at Harvard, they would, um, he would send out a circular, for instance. Uh, one of his many projects was to start a comprehensive natural history of American fish. And he would, uh, he would encourage the American public to send him specimens, which they did. And we still have those letters. They are at Houghton Library in the Agassiz papers. Ordinary people would collect fish and would dispatch them, probably not smelling very good, to Cambridge um, for Agassiz's inspection. And that is something that continued throughout his life. They, uh, the public revered him. Uh, his um, uh, news about Agassiz was on the front pages of newspapers because people were interested in it. In a very bizarre twist, even the um, results of his autopsy were published in the New York Times because the public had an interest in the size of Agassiz's brain when he died. Um, the Agassiz societies that were founded um, in the last decades of the, of the 19th century were, attribu were attributable to Agassiz's influence and they emphasized not so much the theoretical foundations of Agassiz's science, they were not so important, but the collecting. 
um, going out into nature, finding specimens, how to collect them, how to identify them, how to preserve them. The whole tradition of field work is something that is part of the Agassiz, the very difficult and complicated Agassiz success story. So while he failed in many other ways, theoretically, practically, um, as the sort of top dog of American science, in terms of infusing the practice of science um, with the spirit of working in the field, of being out there, that is something that Agassiz is responsible for. Very close to the n to where his summer school for natural history started, we now find Woods Hole Oceanographic Laboratory. Of course, he needed a son, Alexander Agassiz, whom I haven't mentioned here, was a probably the first important American oceanographic sci uh, scientist to to continue the work that he'd been doing. Uh, Alex fixed his museum as well, made it transparent, ordered the specimens, created a much more manageable design for it, and the museum is still there to this day um, for you to visit, probably known mostly for the glass flowers and uh, uh, publicly, but still, it's the same institution. It's something that he put where it is today. So yes, that part um, is a success story. It's just difficult to bracket it or, or move it away from all the rest that I've been talking about. Um, you would describe a man who was a collector, a cataloger, a describer, and a popularizer. But was he, in fact, um, a creative scientist the way we understand the term today? Did he do any experiments? Um, was he just dogmatic about his observations? And I couldn't understand the last part of uh, what you said. Was he, was he actually a scientist the way we understand the term today? Did he, did yeah. he do any experimental science? Uh, well, he was not in the... <laughs> He was not an experimental scientist. There was not the kind of biology that, that, that Agassiz did. Um, his biology was, was descriptive in the old tradition. It was uh, taxonomic in the sense of finding arrangements in nature that would work. Experiments were not uh, what he, except in a limited way, sometimes he would try out certain things. It would see if, you know, a species would survive in, different, in a different kind of environment. But in the sense that um, you know, his colleagues at Harvard um, were beginning um, experimental science, not, no. In that sense, he was, not a, he was a life scientist. And uh, that's probably an important distinction to remember um, as we look at his accomplishments. How far did he go? Was he pro-slavery and a Southern sympathizer for, uh, for the um, Civil War? That's a, that's a very interesting, very difficult question uh, to answer. He did say that he was against slavery, and he did say so publicly. And um, he, um, was he an ardent abolitionist? No, he did not go around saying slavery needs to end, but he agreed with those of his friends and supporters who said that slavery had to end. Um, one of the very poignant sort of um, sub-stories um, associated with Agassiz's racism is um, an exchange that he had with Samuel Gridley Howe, who was probably one of the most courageous abolitionists of the time, who actually turned to Agassiz um, in his function as a member of the Freedmen's Inquiry Commission and asked Agassiz for his opinion as to what should happen with the freed slaves. And Agassiz was adamant that the freed slaves should be kept separate from the North should continue to stay in the South because they were more adapted to the climate there and so forth. And you find how one of the premier abolitionists, the guy who at one point had to flee to Canada because he feared for his life, basically agreeing with all the essential principles of Agassiz's racial theorizing. How agreed with them on racial mixing, he agreed with them on the, on the, on the racial inferiority issue and so forth. There you have an abolitionist who is not challenging any of the foundations of Agassiz's racial theories. So one of the difficult things about the 19th century is to keep the boundaries fluid, because you could have an abolitionist who was as racist as some of the, uh, the pro-slavery people. You would find pro-slavery people who would actually disagree with Agassiz's racial science. Uh, one famous case is John Bachman, a naturalist in Charleston, who had slaves himself but who said, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Agassiz's racial theorizing that the whole notion there were bio biological differences between races was, was nonsense. Um, Bachman was a gardener and he went into his garden and he hybridized 
um, plants all the time, right? And he said, it works, you know, it's absolute nonsense. So it's, it's sort of a miasma, really, that, um, that's very difficult to draw distinct boundaries. Um, so I'm answering a question in a kind of complicated way by saying he said he was against slavery. In a sense, it didn't matter because it did not keep him from pronouncing the things that he did, some of which were not so different from people who were more ardently anti-slavery, um, uh, what people who were more ardently uh, anti-slavery said publicly. So he always said from the beginning, there's a letter he writes to his mother shortly after he has arrived in America, where he says slavery has to end, there's no future for this. At the same time, in the same letter, he talks about his experience in Philadelphia where he's being served by a black waiter and this is a completely appalling experience to him um, as a European to be exposed to, that, uh, to that, um, uh, that thing, which he doesn't want any more of. Uh, almost visceral response that he, at least the way he explains it. Was there one event or something in his life that sort of put him on the road to becoming a racist? Or, I mean, how did he evolve to that position? Well, there was that event that I just mentioned oh. in the Philadelphia letter. But I think more than anything, what became important to him was as, a, as an immigrant, as a European who had arrived, and believe me, I'm not trying to justify anything he said, but by way of explaining it, um, he felt that it was important for him to reaffirm the bond that united him to other white people in America. Um, that he felt that it was somehow his immigrant status would be different if he sort of emphasized the kind of community of Europeans that he was, that he'd entered, that he wanted to be a peer in. And somehow that helped him, this is one explanation, that helped him rationalize his own status. Um, the second, um, as I, as I tried to say in my lecture, the second important factor for him was that he just felt that in order to be taken seriously as a public intellectual, you had to have an opinion on race because this was the most prevalent, the most urgent problem of the age. And he was hugely gratified when Samuel Gridley Howe approached him and said, I want your opinion on this. This is the, what matters right now. We need to figure out the future for America. And there was Agassiz, the scientist, being consulted. We still have those letters. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould was the first to write about them in The Mismeasure of Man in a very poignant little chapter where he um, um, analyzes um, Agassiz's racial attitudes. Uh, the Mismeasure of Man. It's about efforts to use pseudoscientific tools to come up with measurements for racial difference. He also had some role at the, at the Smithsonian, did he not? Sorry? He also had some role at the Smithsonian, yes, did yeah, he not? Yeah, he Especially was, in the 1850s, maybe that was before he set yes, up his own museum. Yeah, he was, he was, nothing in American politics happened without Agassiz, for, uh, until Gray basically had his way. But he was definitely involved in the creation of it. The whole notion of founding a federal institution was very important to Agassiz. And he tried to stock it with uh, his people and uh, people who were responsive to him. He uh, had a collecting relationship with the Smithsonian, so that he would offer them his collections, they would offer him specimens. So there was a vibrant exchange going on between those institutions, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.